Good evening, everybody, and uh, a very warm welcome to our Termly Real Lives. This is uh, an occasion when we take a topic or a question and address it uh, through testimony as well as a Bible talk. We were going to look at shame and guilt this term, but instead we're going to consider the question, is Jesus really in control? Uh, first of all, we'll hear from Marina, one of our ministry trainees. We'll then look at the Bible, chapters 4 and 5 of Mark's Gospel, and then there will be a song to listen to as we think about our response to that. I'll now hand over to Marina. I'm Marina da Corsi. I'm from Italy. I was born in Milan in the northern uh, Italy, uh, but my parents uh, um, were born in the southern Italy. My, ma my mom um, in Sicily and my dad in Naples. And I have a brother, he's younger than me, and our house is in the countryside uh, near Milan. I arrived in England in September 2019, so a few months ago, to attend a biblical school uh, proclamation trust Cornhill in London once a week and to serve the Lord during the rest of the week as a ministry trainee uh, at St. John's. So I'm involved with the practical staff, uh, with the, uh, teenagers, uh, internationals and women. Well, I really miss my family and, of course, the amazing food and the weather, of course. I was sure of my skills, um, it was all on me, uh, taking my decisions, I was in control of my life and so for example I loved experiencing exciting things such as skydiving or sea diving and I thought that I could do any experience um, I wanted to and in my job too, just work hard and I can achieve a career. I also believed in luck and superstition. So before an exam at university, I would put a lucky charm in my pocket. It was a Roman Catholic charm. So when things were going well, I thought uh, that my luck was good. And when things went badly, I thought I had a bad luck. But I never really felt in control. I also felt lots of pressure uh, to succeed and have a good life. So always having to work hard to feel secure financially and in my relationships and to give a, a good impression to everyone around me. I was trapped by the need to keep my reputation. So being honest, I see now that I didn't have security and stability in my life. I was looking in the wrong places. And these things could never give me the security in life that I longed for. I even went to a psychologist in my longing for stability. So, what changed? Um, during an English class, I met some Christian friends and I never read the Bible as an adult. So, for me, it was the first time reading the Bible and I saw that Jesus is the one in control. So that living my life without him was ignoring God. I needed forgiveness to go under the cross of Jesus. And now I have peace with God. I knew that really it's God who is in control. And now I'm free from the pressure of trying to be controlled myself. Well, I'm from Italy and we know how the things are there and they are here. My family is in lockdown and I don't know when I can see them again. But Jesus is giving me peace in my heart because I know even hard things are in his hands. And Jesus has saved me to be forgiven of my sin and to have a relationship with God. Nothing can take that away from me. 
So now, my prayer for my family and my friends is that they can know Jesus. All of us have to die someday. And with the coronavirus now, the risk is really higher. But Jesus promises those who trust believing in him have eternal life. And that gives me certain hope in every situation. So I want to give thanks because Jesus is my king. Last Sunday, the Evangelical Alliance asked Christians to light a candle <clears throat> and put it in their front windows at 7 p.m. I wonder if any of you did do that. We did it. And uh, Suzanne noticed that there were no others lit in our road. Uh, the idea was to give people hope, because in these dark times, Jesus is the light of the world. But is that hope any more substantial <clears throat> than a candle blowing in the wind, when the flame, the light, will be extinguished all too soon? Uh, why should we put our trust in Jesus at a time like this? Why should he provide hope for us? In talking about Psalm 46 last week, I mentioned Jesus being the stronger man. The one who had proven that he was master of everything. Now such a one would be worthy of our trust and our hope. But how can we know that Jesus is this one? In Mark chapter 3 verse 37 Jesus says, In fact no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Uh, Jesus is responding to those who say that the power by which he is performing his miracles comes from Satan. Uh, he says it would be ridiculous for Satan to oppose himself. And so he tells people that what is happening in reality is that before their very eyes, one stronger than Satan has arrived, has bound him and is plundering his house. This is the school playground where the bully is replaced by a new and bigger, stronger child. It's world history as one superpower gives way to the next. It's the corporate world, it's the sporting world. A stronger, better, bigger arrives and all others must give way must submit. In Mark chapters 4 and 5, we see Jesus demonstrating that he is that stronger man, the one who is master of everything. In the four incidents Mark records, Jesus is confronted by a storm, by a demon-possessed man, by a sick woman and by a dead girl. And in each of those situations, he proves to be master, stronger. The conclusion to the first incident sees the disciples ask, who is this? And that's the question we should all have in mind, whether in this section of Mark's Gospel or the whole of Mark's Gospel or Matthew, Mark, Luke, John as well. Who is this? Who is this that we should put our hope and our trust in him at a time like this, who is this that we should put our hope and trust in him for today and all eternity? Now, in each of these uh, incidents, there is a pattern that we shall follow. There is a crisis. It may be something long-standing. It may be more immediate. Those involved have given up on the crisis because it's beyond their ability to deal with. Jesus resolves the crisis. He can do what humanity cannot do. The response of those who look on is fear and rejection. But above all, the question remains, who is this? Let's look first of all then at the crises that confound humanity, the crises that confound humanity. 
The first scene is a common one in the Gospels. Jesus is in a boat on the lake with his disciples. But this time, chapter 4, verse 37, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Now, remember that a number of these disciples are fishermen. This is their backyard. This is their office. This is where, as children, they would have played. For them to fear drowning tells you that this is no ordinary storm. For they, the experts, find themselves out of their depth. The second scene is in the Gentile, the non-Jewish area across the lake called Garaza. Here, a demon-possessed man who has been thrown out by his village lives, or maybe we'd rather say exists. The locals have tried to restrain him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. They've done all they could, but it's failed. The third scene takes us back across the lake into Jewish territory, and it sees a father approach Jesus because his daughter is sick. The seriousness of the situation is brought home as Jairus, who has standing in the community as one of the synagogue rulers, falls at Jesus' feet. He pleaded earnestly with Jesus. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her that she will be healed and live. But on his way to the synagogue leader's house, Jesus is interrupted by someone in the crowd, which is the fourth scene. Mark tells us that a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And the woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Instead of getting better, she grew worse. The experts, in this case the doctors, have given up on her and she has run out of money. But for all that expense and all their efforts, she has got worse. They have failed. Now, the delay in reaching Jairus's house results in a message coming. Verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher any more? It's too late. And to make sure we don't miss the point, Mark tells us that when Jesus reaches the house, the mourners are leading the people in crying and wailing. When Jesus says to them, she's not dead but asleep, they laughed at him. They have given up. Death has won. Jesus is no longer needed. It's over. In the face of natural disaster, spiritual oppression, sickness and death, Human resources will run out. Humanity's ability to be in control will come to an end. The lie that we are in charge is cruelly exposed. Uh, last summer, my uh, mother was taken into hospital with viral encephalitis, an infection on the brain. And I was strangely comforted when one of the doctors on the neurology ward admitted that they didn't know much about how the brain worked. We listen to the medics say almost daily that COVID-19 is a new virus, a very clever virus, and we need to learn more about how it works. The reality at the moment is that they, we, don't know. 
the humility of the experts is in striking contrast with some of the bombastic statements from our world leaders who have been criticised for using the language and imagery of war in the face of the COVID-19 outbreak. The danger, of course, for them is that in setting up the conflict against this unseen enemy and promoting victory, is that they don't know what victory will look like, let alone when it will come. What death toll will prove to be acceptable to claim victory? And of course, in any conflict, you can lose as well as win. They might just be setting themselves up for a fall. Will humanity find the humility to acknowledge that there is much we do not know, that there are many situations beyond our control? Will I be prepared to humble myself to acknowledge those things to myself? Will we, will I, be prepared to look beyond the intelligence, the skill, the ingenuity of my fellow men and women to another, one who has mastery over everything. In the face of these crises that confound humanity, we see Jesus as the master of everything. Jesus, the master of of everything. Let's go back to that first scene, the first incident, the storm on the lake. The disciples fear they're going to drown. Verse 39 of chapter 4, Jesus got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Jesus commands the school with mere words and the effect is dramatic. We might say as dramatic as the school itself. Storms were common on the lake but when they had blown themselves out the swell could last for hours. Not on this occasion. Jesus speaks and there is instant calm. Maybe it's no wonder that the disciples in the boat were terrified and asked each other, who is this? In the second scene, Jesus also restores calm. The man Lazarus approaches Jesus and the demons who recognise his power over him beg him not to send them out of the region. He shouts at the top of his voice, what do you want with me Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the region. So Jesus gives the demons permission to come out of the man into a herd of pigs who destroy themselves just as that man was being destroyed. Mark sums up the effect of Jesus in verse 15. When they, when the crowds came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. What a contrast. Seated, dressed in his right mind. And their fear, the fear of the locals, leads the people to plead with Jesus to leave their region. <clears throat> Who is this? In scene four, the woman touches Jesus' cloak. 
When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Uh, amazingly, in such a large crowd, Jesus knows he's been touched. At once, Jesus realised that power had gone out from him. He turned round in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Uh, given the press of the crowd, and we know what that's like when we've been in a large crowd. Jesus' disciples said, you see the people crowding against you, and yet you can ask who touched you? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. The woman comes forward and her cleansing, her trust in Jesus is affirmed. Who is this? As we return to the third scene, we might be tempted to agree with the messenger and the mourners. Death does indeed mark the end of hope. There can be no healing now. But to Jairus, Jesus says, verse 36, don't be afraid, just believe. In other words, he's saying, you were right to come to me, right to humble yourself before me. So don't fear now. Continue to trust in me. Uh, don't believe in your daughter's recovery. Believe in me. And so Jesus, with the daughter's father and mother and a few disciples, goes in to where the child was. Verse 41, he took her by the hand and said to her, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. No extended bed rest is required. She walks and she is to eat. His word, once again, has immediate effect. Who is this? Jesus proves his mastery in the face of natural disaster, spiritual oppression, sickness, and death. When human hopes and resources have run out, when people give up, Jesus proves to be stronger. Jesus proves he is indeed in control. So Jesus is the master of everything. He can deal with the crises that confound humanity. What will our response be? How are we going to answer the question, who is this? Will we be completely astonished, like the few who saw him raise Jairus' daughter? Maybe we've never given a second thought that these things could be mastered, let alone death. Maybe now is a good time for that second thought to turn into action. Why not read the whole of Mark's Gospel? Maybe find a Christian friend to help answer some of the questions or to read it with you. Uh, listen again to us here at St John's on Easter Day at 10.30 for more on Jesus' conquest of death. Or will we be like those from... Uh, the, or will we be like the disciples who were terrified... Or those from Gaza who were afraid because of what they had just witnessed. Given their reactions to the squall and the demoniac, we can see why they would react like this. He has proven more powerful. He has proven stronger than something, than someone they were terrified of. They could not control. So it is right to fear him. In the playground, 
It's right to fear the new and the bigger bully. In world history, it's right to fear the latest superpower. We are bound to respect to fear the new number one. It would be foolish not to. So are you ready to allow Jesus his rightful place as the stronger? The one who overcomes all, even death. If so, will you react like those in Gerasa, who pleaded with Jesus to leave their region? This Jesus is too powerful for you, too overwhelming, too terrifying. The last thing you want is him meddling with your life. So he best be gone. How much safer to return to the things and the situation as they were, the things that we know and can cope with. How much easier to turn my back on Jesus. Or will you, like the disciples, ask the question, who is this? The disciples knew that there was one who had the right and the power to command the wind and the waves. They'd grown up hearing about him in the synagogue version of Sunday school. He is the Lord, the creator. He is the promise-making, promise-keeping God of Israel. He is the one of whom they would have read in Psalm 104, 104 verses 5 to 7. He sets the earth on its foundations. It cannot be moved. You covered it with the watery depths as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. But at your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took flight. Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves. Did that cause a ripple in their thinking? Did he give them one of those rather itchy inklings that maybe the one in front of them was a lot more than what they'd been thinking or been allowing. Surely this would be unthinkable, wouldn't it? But who is this? I wonder if your mind is open to the possibility that Jesus is the creator and Lord of the universe. Or maybe you're thinking, if there were to be such a being, why doesn't he stop the devastation, the pain, the suffering, the mourning, now. In fact, why hasn't he done that already? Why didn't Jesus do it then? Well, what Jesus is doing in his time on earth is pointing us to a day when all natural disaster, all spiritual oppression, all sickness and all death will be dealt with, will be brought to an end. The day He returns as Lord and judge of all. And in his mercy, here in Mark chapters 4 and 5, he gives us a glimpse of that power. So that when that day comes, we might be ready. And we get ready by asking and answering the question, who is this? Uh, We get ready by humbling ourselves before him as Lord, acknowledging that he alone is the master of everything, that he holds the present and the future in his hands. We acknowledge that we have sought to take his place as Lord. We've lived under our own rule and rejected his. And so we ask for his forgiveness won by his death on the cross. And we go on to trust him for a new life, both today, but also in the eternal future, which will see all those who trust in him, join him in the wonderful new creation where we are promised. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Jesus is 
the stronger. He is the master of everything. And we see that very clearly in Mark chapters 4 and 5. And so in a time like this, is Jesus really in control? Is he worth trusting? Can we look to him for hope? The answer, of course, is that we can, we should, and we must. How will you answer the question? Who is this?